Yes, Mrs. Worthington, I understand. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Of course, Mrs. Worthington, I will certainly do so. Would that blue-haired old windbag ever shut up? Susan Morgan asked herself with annoyance as she listened to the wife of the Birch Grove Mansion's chairman of the board rant. But as Birch Grove's director of development, Susan knew she had no choice but to listen and agree with the old woman's pontifications. The young woman wasn't inclined to tolerate fools gladly, and she was particularly annoyed when someone thought they were smarter than she was just because of their family's wealth. I've seen enough rich bitches who think their money gives them the right to meddle in other people's business, Susan snorted to herself. A glance at her watch only added to her disappointment. She was late for an important meeting. But just as Susan was about to cut the conversation short, the older woman abruptly stopped her monologue. Gosh, look at the time. If I don't hang up now, I'm going to be late for my hairdresser's appointment. I understand, Mrs. Worthington. I'm sorry to have kept you so long, Susan replied without a hint of sarcasm. After her caller finally called back, Susan quickly texted her husband, dinner with a potential client. Don't wait up. When the message was sent, she hurriedly put her desk in order, checked her makeup in the hand mirror, and then walked out the door of her small office. This room had originally been the butler's pantry at Birch Grove Mansion, but at least it has my name on the door, she thought. As she headed down the hall, Evita, her Hispanic secretary, called out to her. Are you leaving, Senora Morgan? Without slowing her step, Susan looked over her shoulder irritably. I'm leaving to call a potential donor. I won't be back today. Evita watched the rhythmic movement of the skirt of her boss's expensive suit and heard the clatter of her high heels on the marble floor of the mansion. As soon as the woman disappeared behind the door, Evita rushed down the hallway to the executive director's office and stopped at his secretary's desk. Is he gone? She asked Christina. Sigh, Christina replied. He left about 10 minutes ago. He said he had an important meeting. Evita smirked, like a schedule, this week, last week, the week before that. They both have meetings at the same time? Do they think we don't know what's really going on? She looked toward the exit and hissed, Puta! The two young women giggled and went back to their work. Professor Daniel Morgan looked around at the many faces in his introduction to economics class. Although he knew that few of them would show a lasting interest in economics, he hoped that he could at least spark some intellectual curiosity about the subject. To spark that interest required an unconventional approach. He clicked an icon on his tablet computer and a projected image of a graph appeared on the wall. Today, he intoned, we're going to talk about the concepts of supply, demand, and price. Some comedian in the lecture hall let out a soft groan, causing everyone to laugh. Daniel was unfazed. I know, I know, boring. But these abstract concepts have an impact on the real world. Let me give you an example. He reached out and picked up a piece of the painting, holding it up for all to see. Does anyone recognize this? He asked. Marilyn Monroe by Andy Warhol, a female voice chimed in. Sorry, miss, I'm afraid you're in the wrong class. Art appreciation is in a different building, Daniel grumbled. When the laughter subsided, Daniel smiled. Seriously, our art lover is absolutely right. So why am I showing you Andy Warhol in economics class? The answer is that this particular work, or at least one that looks almost exactly like it, sold in 2022 for just over $195 million. That makes it a record-breaking sale for a work by an American artist. The students whistled several times. I assume, Daniel continued, that no one in this class was a customer. This elicited a few chuckles. There are no billionaires here? Well, I was hoping. Anyway, the point is that at that price, there was only one buyer for Andy's Marilyn. However, any of us can go to the university bookstore right now and buy a reproduction of Marilyn for $20. So why are there so many buyers at the bookstore and so few at the auction? It's all about the price. At a price of $195 million, there was only one buyer, but at a price of $20, the demand increases dramatically. Before you start objecting, I know that there are many factors that affect the market demand for any good product or service. We'll look at them in the next sessions. But the fact remains that price is one of, if not the most important factor, that determines demand. When the class was over, 
Daniel was glad that a few students had come up to ask questions or give their point of view. At least I got them thinking about the topic, he thought with satisfaction. Back in his office, he put Monroe's fingerprint away in a file cabinet, then pulled his cell phone out of his pocket. He had felt it vibrate during the lecture, but had made it a rule never to interrupt class to check it. Now he saw that Susan would not be home again this evening. It bothered him that it happened so often, but at least it gave him a chance to stop by and check on his father. When Ezra had been diagnosed with Parkinson's a few years ago, the older man had claimed to be doing just fine in his own home. But Daniel saw his father's symptoms worsening, and his concern prompted him to visit him more often. When he got through to his father, he rambled on and on about symptoms, real and imagined, about doctors who didn't know what they were doing, and about the problems of the world at large. When Daniel finally managed to ask if it would be convenient for him to stop by, his father insisted that he come and stay for dinner. Daniel tried to protest, but his father interrupted him. Here, he said, talk to Paloma, and held out the phone. Paloma was Ezra Morgan's caregiver and assistant. When her father's condition deteriorated markedly, Daniel insisted that he be cared for full time if he wanted to stay at home. The old man sullenly agreed and immediately began to drive away every caregiver the agency sent with his complaints, insults, and hostile behavior. Just when Daniel decided he had no choice but to put his father in a nursing home, Paloma arrived. The young woman had two significant advantages over her predecessors. First, she was unexpectedly beautiful, which Ezra definitely appreciated. Second, Paloma was not at all embarrassed by Ezra's rudeness. When he snapped at her, she returned the favor. When he refused to follow the doctor's orders, she pestered him until he gave up and complied. And when he was grumpy and rude, she ignored him until he stopped trying to piss her off. One day, when Daniel stopped by to see how things were going with the new caregiver, his father surprised him by stating that he approved of Paloma. She doesn't hold a grudge against me, he declared, and Daniel dared to hope that they'd finally found a solution. Those hopes were dealt a serious blow about 10 months later when Paloma called Daniel to tell him she was going to quit. This is my son, Marco, she told him. My mom has been taking care of him, but now my grandmother is sick and my mom will have to live with her. Besides, it's time for Marco to go to school and there's no way I can take care of him and Senora Morgana at the same time. If Daniel was upset by the news, Ezra simply refused to accept it. To Daniel's amazement, the old man found a solution. Come live in my house, he told her. The place is spacious enough. Besides, you'll save on rent and travel. I'll even pay for groceries. What about Marco? You don't want a six-year-old running around your house. You know, I've had a six-year-old boy over before. Besides, Marco will give me someone to talk to when I get tired of your nagging. She went to Daniel's office to discuss the proposal with him. Once he got over his surprise, he began to see the advantages. Besides constant care from the man his father liked, Daniel thought that living in a family circle might be good for his father. It's up to you, Paloma, Daniel told her. I think it would be a good decision for Papa, and I'd feel better if he was being cared for by someone he liked. But you have to decide if it will be good for you and Marco. I think it might work, Senor Daniel, but it would be best if you tried to stop by more often. Well, for your father's sake. And Marco will be glad too. To his amazement, she blushed, then turned and sprinted out the door. Her reaction embarrassed him, but he was glad when he learned that she had accepted his father's proposal. Now, after 18 months, Daniel wasn't the least bit surprised to hear his father give in to Paloma's wishes, nor was he upset when she asked him to stay for dinner too. Given that the alternative was a lonely takeout meal on his college campus, Daniel didn't fight back much. In addition to her nursing skills, Paloma turned out to be an excellent cook. It will be nice to have a home-cooked meal for a change, he thought, and his mood improved. Susan hated the long drive through the countryside, but realized it was necessary. Neither she nor Grant could afford to be recognized when they were developing prospects together. She was concerned not only about the length of the trip, but also about the small, dilapidated houses along the way. I used to live in a hole just like this, she thought, and the memories came back to her. Her father abandoned the family when she and her sister were in grammar school. Her mother and her two daughters were forced to move into a rented shack that her mother could barely afford on her maid's salary. The girls' classmates at school fared little better, but that didn't stop them from bullying their sisters mercilessly. But Susan was smart. She had done well in high school, 
well enough to get a full scholarship to the University of Pennsylvania. She had been indoctrinated that education was a way out of poverty, a way to achieve the same lifestyle as other female students at the University of Pennsylvania. And while these girls were not unfriendly, the socioeconomic differences could not be overlooked. While her classmates danced at fraternity and sorority parties on the weekends, Susan sat in her dormitory studying for Monday's tests. While they spent the summer in Europe, she worked on campus. In her junior year, however, Susan hit a snag when a handsome economics teaching assistant caught her eye. Daniel Morgan was on his way to a doctorate, but he wasn't a nerd. He had a good sense of humor and liked to socialize. When he met her, he found Susan's combination of intelligence and beauty irresistible. There were rules against relationships between assistants and students, but since he was in the economics department and she was in the fine arts department, those rules were easily ignored. Susan had already dated men and had a few sexual encounters, but she was determined to be a better person and knew that a reputation as a slut on campus was not the way to go. Now, faced with the prospect of a relationship with a man who had a future, she did everything she could to take advantage of it. He didn't stand a chance. A man with a future, she thought angrily. She had expected Daniel to join one of the large investment banks or consulting firms that regularly recruited on campus. When he told her that his dreams lay in academia, she was quietly disappointed. But perhaps he would head a major institute, she consoled herself. A quick internet search convinced her that several university presidents had economics backgrounds. But now, seven years after their wedding, she found herself living in a backwoods college town with a husband who was content to teach at a backwoods university. This is not the future I wanted, she cursed to herself. In this dysfunctional environment, she took a job as a fundraiser for a local museum in a converted mansion, formerly owned by a Pennsylvania oil baron. Once again, she found herself subservient to a clan of wealthy matrons and their chatty offspring, listening to their gossip and submitting to their overbearing demands. But it won't last long, she vowed to herself, steering the car behind the small rural motel where she and Grant had met. I found a new trail to climb. No sooner had Daniel gotten out of the car at his father's house than the front door swung open and a small ball of boyish energy flew toward him. Senor Daniel, Senor Daniel, will you play soccer with me? shouted Marco. Marco, Paloma shouted as she stepped out onto the porch. Leave Senor Daniel alone. He's been teaching all day and he's tired. No sooner had the boy's face lowered than Daniel waved his mother away. It's okay, Paloma. Come on, Marco, show me your skills. And the two of them began to play, leading, passing, and kicking a grass-stained soccer ball. As they ran around the yard, Daniel noticed that Paloma had gone into the house and took his father out to watch them. The old man was excited and cheered them on, even though he had never been to a soccer game in his life. They finally stopped when Paloma called them to dinner. Marco objected, but Daniel was just as happy to agree. I'm in no shape to keep up with that kid, especially playing soccer. Expecting traditional Latin American food, Daniel was pleasantly surprised when Paloma served a Mediterranean-style dish. Chicken kebab on basmati rice with Greek salad and pita bread on the side. Ezra grumbled that he wanted a hamburger, but Daniel noticed that he'd put his plate away. They ate as a family, talking about the past day, plans for the week, and other little things that lifted Daniel's spirits even more. He realized he hadn't thought about Susan since he'd arrived. As they were clearing away their plates, Paloma leaned toward them and whispered, In case you're wondering, I try to follow a Mediterranean diet with Senor Morgan when he lets me. I want to guard his heart as much as possible. Thank you, Paloma. Whatever you're doing, it seems to be working. I haven't seen Daddy so energetic in a long time. After the dishes were in the dishwasher, they all moved to the den. After talking some more, Daniel noticed that Marco was getting quieter. I guess even seven-year-olds can get tired after playing so hard, he thought with amusement. Paloma noticed it too and took Marco to his room. By the time she had supervised her son's preparation for bed, he was half asleep. But as soon as he lay down, his eyes flashed again. Mama, may Senor Daniel come to say goodnight to you? We don't want to impose on him, she said sternly, but then relented. But I'll ask. The boy's request pleased Daniel, and he eagerly followed Paloma to Marco's bed. To his surprise, the boy reached up and hugged him, then lay down, rolled over, and closed his eyes. Good night, Marco, Daniel said affectionately, tucking the blanket over the boy's shoulder. Buenas noches. When they returned to the den, 
Daniel saw that his father had dozed off too. He helped Paloma carry him into the bedroom and put him on the bed. Daniel realized with horror how little his father weighed. After they returned to the den, Daniel thanked Paloma for the treat and told her he was heading home. Maybe you'll stay a little longer? She asked, reaching for his hand but stopped. I, could you tell me a little about the painting in the parlor? Sure, he said, and followed her into another room. There, Andy Warhol's painting of Marilyn Monroe in blue hung on the wall in a special frame. The frame was protected by unbreakable glass firmly screwed to the wall. Under the four corners of the frame were special pads, sensitive to any changes in pressure between the wall and the artwork. On the opposite wall, two small devices emitted infrared beams, searching for anything approaching the artwork. I'm sure my dad warned you about safety, Daniel said, and Paloma nodded. That's why I don't let Marco in here, she explained. He banged his soccer ball against the wall once, and in no time at all, security showed up here to investigate. She shook her head. We won't make that mistake again. But I don't know how your father ended up with such a special painting. It's a good story. My grandfather was a printer in Germany before World War II. He escaped just before things got bad and came to America with only his first name. In fact, he lost it too. Some immigration clerk on Ellis Island replaced Morgenstern with Morgan. Anyway, my grandfather found a job as a printer in New York City and brought his son, my father, into the business to learn the craft. My father became interested in silkscreen printing, which in the early 1960s was just becoming popular for artwork. To make a long story short, he began working as an apprentice for a company that printed many of the silkscreens created by Andy Warhol. Apparently, one day Warhol noticed my father working late and took a liking to him. On impulse, he gave him the very proof on the wall and even signed a dedication on the back. It's a great gift to someone Warhol hardly knew. I agree, but you have to remember that at the time, Warhol was only selling his silk screens for a few hundred dollars. He probably felt that an artist's sample wasn't that valuable. In any case, it wasn't until later that Warhol's work began to skyrocket in value. But isn't it dangerous to keep him here? Not many people know my father has a Warhol, and it's never been appraised. But when this auction got so much publicity, we couldn't ignore the risk. That's when my father took all the security measures. I won't say they're foolproof, but as you and Marco have learned, even touching the wall elicits a quick security response. She looked at the painting again. I can see why your father wants to keep it here. He must be very proud of her. Yes, Daniel nodded, and I'm very proud of him. Paloma smiled and nodded. A little later, Daniel got in his car to drive back to the old Victorian-style house the university had provided him on campus. As he drove away, he looked back at the light streaming through the windows in his father's house. I wish it were as bright in my house, he sighed. Susan was often away from home these days, and even when she was around, the atmosphere was chilly. He shook his head and drove away. As Susan left the motel, she thought, nothing helps a girl relax like a good night out, she thought contentedly. And Grant Nicholson was good, in no small part because he was truly in love with her. But as she left their dilapidated love nest, her thoughts drifted to her husband. It's not that Daniel's a bad husband, and he's certainly not a bad lover. But he just doesn't have the drive and ambition I need. Grant likes to socialize with all those millionaires on the board, and he's good at it. Daniel is content to go to university parties and socialize with other faculty members. Every time I have to attend such events, I just want to scream. She gripped the steering wheel tighter. But as soon as his old man backs off and Daniel gets his inheritance, I'll divorce him in a heartbeat. And when I get my half of the Warhol proceeds in the house, I'll have as much money as those rich bitches, not to mention a high-profile husband. As she pulled into their driveway, her face contorted in a grin. University housing. Well, I can put up with this dump for a while longer and so can my husband. The next time Daniel saw Paloma, she was no longer smiling. He had just finished grading the exam when he heard a knock on his office door. When he looked up, he was surprised to see a young woman standing there, and the look on her face made him uneasy. What's wrong, Paloma? Did something happen to my dad? Is Marco okay? She hurried in, closing the door behind her, and sat down in one of his chairs. Your father is fine, Daniel. My mom will stay with him and Marco while I'm here. But... He shook his head impatiently. So what happened? What's going on? 
You know I have a big family in this neighborhood, right? I don't know, but go ahead. One of my sisters, Christina, works at Birch Grove. She is the secretary to Senor Nicholson, the executive director. Okay. Anyway, Christina meets with Mrs. Morgan every day at the mansion. Yes, but... Daniel, I'm sorry, but your wife and Senor Nicholson are having an affair. Her words hurt him deeply. His first impulse was to deny the possibility because he didn't want to believe it. But given the current state of his relationship with his wife, he immediately realized how an affair could explain what was happening. Pulling himself together, he leaned forward in his chair. How does your sister know about this? He asked intently. Paloma looked unhappy. We have a cousin who works as a maid at the Pocono View Motel. It's just north of here, about 20 miles down the highway. He waved his hand impatiently, and she hurried onward. Your wife and Senor Nicholson meet there almost every week. The last time was two days ago when you had dinner with Senor Morgan, Marco, and me. He gritted his teeth, remembering that night and how late Susan had gone to bed. But he kept his composure and controlled his voice. Paloma, this is very serious. I can't just take the word of someone I've never met, even if she is your cousin. I know, I know, but you don't have to take her word for it. Maybe you can go there with me now? Half an hour later at the motel, Paloma was introducing Daniel to her cousin Lourdes, who did not speak English well. But Paloma helped her with the translation, and the maid led them to a storage room in the motel's main hallway. She opened the door to the ventilation system and pulled out the recording system hidden there. Daniel looked at Lourdes, then at Paloma. How did that get in here? He growled. Our family was gathered and Christina told us of her suspicions about Senor Nicholson and his frequent meetings with Senora Morgan. When she showed us a picture, Lords recognized them as a couple who frequented the motel regularly. She looked pleadingly at Daniel. I'm sorry, Daniel, but I knew I had to find out the truth. I gave Lords the tape recorder. I hope you don't hate me for that. Daniel ignored her implied question. Instead, he pointed to the device. Have you been listening to this? He demanded. She hung her head. Sigh, partially. Lords played it for me when she called. That's when I realized I had to tell you. Okay, Daniel said grimly. Tell her to turn on the tape. When Lords pressed the arrow button, the full volume startled the three of them. My God, Grant, that's it, that's it, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Don't stop, don't stop, don't stop, ah! burst out of the small speaker. Lords quickly stopped the playback and then turned to Paloma. You want her to go back to the beginning? Paloma asked Daniel. The pale-faced Daniel shook his head. I didn't know I recognized Susan's voice. He rubbed his temples. I really don't want to listen to the whole damn thing. Let's just move on. My cousin fiddled with the volume control, then pressed the play button. At first, they heard only the rustle of the sheets and the groan of the bed springs. After a minute, the lover's conversation resumed. Gosh, Susan, you're amazing. I just can't get enough of you, Grant Nicholson said admiringly. Then his tone became almost insistent. Honestly, baby, I don't want to wait any longer. Just say the word and I'll divorce my wife tomorrow. All I want is to be with you. No, came Susan's voice sharply. Don't you realize, Grant, we can't do anything until old Daniel passes away? Once he's gone and Daniel inherits the war hall, I can divorce him. He'll have to auction it off as part of the settlement agreement, and I'll get my half of the proceeds. After that, you can say goodbye to Greta, and we'll finally be together. Are you sure you can get half of Warhol? I thought the inheritance was protected. The smirk on her face was evident in Susan's voice. Don't worry about that. I have a rogue who knows his way around that. And since he gets paid based on the size of the deal, I can guarantee he's highly motivated. Yeah, but how much longer do we have to wait? Whined Nicholson. Be patient, little one, Susan reassured him. The old man is going downhill fast. We'll get what we want soon enough. Daniel reached out and poked his finger angrily at the off button. That sneaky bitch! She's got it all figured out. He slammed his fist on the counter, startling the two women. Then he turned and walked out of the motel. Paloma gave Lords a quick hug, then grabbed the recorder and hurried to the parking lot. She found Daniel standing by his car, staring into space. He turned to her as she approached, 
his eyes reflecting the anger and despair of a man who had been betrayed. I tried so hard, Paloma. I knew she wasn't happy in our marriage, but I kept trying to make things better. The expression on his face darkened. Now I know why nothing worked. There was determination in his voice now. Get in the car, we need to get back to town. She got into the car on the passenger side, and as they pulled onto the road, she said timidly, I hope you're not angry with me, Daniel. I thought you might want to know what she was doing. He shook his head from side to side. I'm not angry with you, Paloma, but I'm very angry with Susan. What are you going to do? You're not going to hurt her, are you? He glanced at her. Yes, I'm going to hurt her and Nicholson at the same time. Seeing the look on her face, he added, but not in the way you envision. I'm not a violent man, but I guarantee they won't like what happens. She reached out to take his hand. I don't want you to get in trouble, Daniel. I just couldn't. He smiled weakly at her. Don't worry, Paloma, everything will be fine. Then his smile disappeared. While you deal with mom and Marco, I need to talk to dad. He shook his head sadly. He was so excited when I married Susan. He was very impressed with her, couldn't wait for us to have kids. When he hears what I found out, he'll be as upset as I am. He looked at Paloma with a wry expression. It's ironic, you know. I used to get so upset every time Susan said she wasn't ready to start a family. But now I'm very glad we didn't. They drove the rest of the way in silence, each immersed in their own thoughts. The conversation with his father was long and agonizing, but eventually the two men worked out a plan of action. Daniel's first step was to file for divorce to thwart Susan's plan. The father promised that he would ask his attorney to recommend a divorce lawyer. He also warned his son not to say or do anything that might tell Susan what he had learned. I can do that, Dad, Daniel agreed. I'll just avoid her as long as possible until I'm ready to sue her. Considering how little time we spend with each other, that shouldn't be too hard. To hide his feelings, Daniel spent most of the weekend on campus, checking papers, updating lesson plans, and generally trying to make sure his academic life wasn't disrupted too much by the impending divorce. When his father called him with a proposal on Monday, Daniel immediately contacted the attorney's office to set up a meeting. But he was disappointed to learn that he wouldn't be able to meet with the woman until Thursday. He thought about looking for another attorney online, but then decided against it. If Susan tries to pull any legal shenanigans, I need someone really good in my corner. I can hold out a little longer. When Thursday finally came, Daniel was glad he'd been patient. His new attorney seemed competent and confident. I think I know what your wife is up to, but I don't think you need to worry about your father's painting, the woman assured him. If we file the paperwork in a timely manner, there's no way Warhol will be part of the estate settlement. She promised that she would have his lawsuit ready for filing next week and could serve the court order the same day. Almost done, Daniel thought, walking back to his office on campus. And with any luck, we'll take care of Mr. Grant Nicholson too. For the first time since he'd learned of Susan's betrayal, he felt himself relaxing a little. A phone call on Sunday shattered his complacency. When he answered, at first he heard nothing but a woman's sobs. I'm so sorry, Daniel. I tried so hard to help him, I really did. An icy dread gripped his heart. Who can I help, Paloma? What happened? It's Senor Morgan, she called out, then stopped. I have to go. The medics are here. The line cut off. Jumping to his feet, Daniel ran to his car and raced to his father's house. The street was blocked by a fire truck, an ambulance, and another car from the fire department. When he parked on the street, he ran to the house and was just in time to see the paramedics rolling the gurney out onto the porch. Is he all right? He asked frantically. The technician looked at him. Your son? Yes, yes. Is he alive? The man shook his head slowly. I'm sorry, but there was nothing we could do. When we got there, he was gone. His heart had stopped beating. It looked like he'd had a massive stroke or aneurysm. What about defibrillation? Would that help? The man looked at him sympathetically. I'm sorry, sir, but even if we could restart his heart, nothing else could work. Do you understand? You wouldn't want that, and neither would he. As the gurney was loaded into the ambulance and slowly driven away, Daniel could only stand there in shock. Finally, he forced himself into the house. 
Upon seeing him, Paloma rushed to him and sobbed in his arms. I'm so sorry, Daniel. I tried so hard to get him back. I did chest compressions until the paramedics arrived, but it wasn't enough. I'm so sorry. Through her tears, he pulled her against him to look into her face. It's not your fault, Paloma. You did the best you could. I talked to the emergency room doctor outside. He said dad must have had a stroke or a brain aneurysm. He probably died before you even got to him. She put her head down on Daniel's chest and continued to sob. He was sitting at the table chatting with me. All of a sudden he grabbed his head and said it hurt. Then he just rolled over and fell to the floor. Oh Daniel, it was horrible. He gently guided the distraught woman to a chair for her to sit in and then went to get water for them both. When he returned, he asked, where is Marco? Marco? Madre de Dios, I almost forgot, he's at school. I have to pick him up. She began to cry again. Marco will be so upset. He loved your father very much. She hurried away, leaving Daniel alone in the suddenly empty house. He sat for a long time, grief clouding his attempts to realize how suddenly his life had changed. He knew his father was dying, but he hadn't been prepared for losing him so soon. His own tears flowed again, and there was no one to comfort him. Finally, he calmed down enough to start making a list of people to be notified and tasks to be accomplished. After writing down everything he could think of, he began the sorrowful task of making phone calls. After calling or leaving messages for the most urgent, Daniel locked up his father's house and drove to Birchgrove to run the errand he'd left for last. As much as he hated the thought, he decided to break the news to Susan in person. I want to see how she reacts, he thought bitterly. She was astonished when he entered her little office and on hearing the news, said all that was necessary and showed appropriate sorrow. But as he watched her, he had to bite his tongue to keep from bursting into anger. These are crocodile tears, he muttered to himself. She must be thrilled, for now she could go on with her plan. But he managed to restrain himself until he left. As soon as he left, Susan sprinted out of the office and, almost bouncing, ran down the hall to break the news to Grant Nicholson. Grant was startled by Susan's sudden appearance and caught off guard by the news she broke. He immediately began to express his condolences, but she interrupted him. Don't you see, this is good news. It's what we've been waiting for. The old man is gone, his estate goes to Daniel. I can file for divorce, settle the estate, and when everything is finalized, you and I can be together. Grant felt his own excitement match her excitement. I can't believe the wait is over. When do you plan to file for divorce? She thought for a moment. I don't want to seem heartless. I'll wait until his father is buried and there's a memorial service before I apply. That makes sense, Grant admitted, but don't wait too long. Remember, it will probably take me a while to get things straightened out with Greta. The next few days for Daniel were filled with all the sorrowful duties that death entails. The first and most pressing duty was the funeral of his father. Although his father was not an observant man, he had left a directive that he wanted to be buried according to Jewish tradition. This meant organizing the burial the next day. As soon as arrangements were made for his father's burial, Daniel began organizing a memorial service for friends and neighbors who were unable to attend the funeral. He had no other living relatives, but Ezra had made many friends during his career, and now they had come to pay their last respects. Daniel's friends and co-workers also came to offer their condolences and support. The fact that so many people attended the funeral brought him some comfort. Both the funeral and the memorial service were difficult for Daniel, not only because of the grief he had experienced, but also because he was forced to attend them with Susan. As before, she played the role of the grieving wife beautifully. But Daniel knew what her true thoughts were, and his anger turned to fierce hatred. During all of this, Daniel's new attorney called to get instructions on how to file for divorce. Given the many responsibilities he faced, Daniel asked her to postpone the divorce. I'll need to get in touch with you, he told her. My life is pretty crazy right now. After the memorial service was over, a new unexpected complication arose. Back at her father's house, Paloma asked him when he wanted Marco and her to move out. Daniel became indignant. You can't leave, Paloma. For one thing, you have nowhere to go, and I have no intention of kicking you out on the street. Besides, if the house is empty, it will become a target for thieves or vandals. Besides, if you go anywhere else, it will probably mean transferring Marco to a new school. He's fine as he is, I don't want to take any chances. You have to stay at least for a while? 
She gratefully accepted the invitation, knowing full well that Daniel's kindness and concern were a bigger factor than the reasons he gave. After his father was buried and the services were completed, Daniel contacted his father's attorney to find out what needed to be done to dispose of his estate. The list of steps he had to take in connection with the probate process was very long. When he finished going over them with Daniel, the attorney added an unexpected duty. Ezra, the lawyer informed Daniel, had requested that the reading of the will take place as soon as possible, even before it went to court. Moreover, his father had left a list of people to be invited. Upon hearing the list, Daniel understood everything. I have one request, he said to the family lawyer. To make the reading of the will as formal as possible, could we hold it at your law office? If it is held there and your office sends out invitations, I think there will be a better chance of everyone who should be there coming. The old man readily agreed. On the appointed day of the reading, Daniel and Susan arrived at the lawyer's office separately. Taking their seats at the small conference table in the law library, they greeted each other with strained cordiality. With the exception of his father's care services, they had hardly spent any time together. Right now, despite her outward calm, Daniel could tell his wife was almost seething with excitement. He, on the other hand, was calm and collected. A few minutes later, Paloma walked in and introduced herself to the lawyer. Susan stared at her, then leaned over to Daniel and demanded angrily, What is she doing here? He looked at her without emotion. She was invited. Before Susan could answer, Grant Nicholson entered the room. Were you invited too? She asked. He nodded. I'm not sure exactly why, but the invitation was perfectly clear. At this point, the lawyer stood up and cleared his throat sharply. May I have your attention, please? It appears that everyone who has been invited is present. The late Mr. Morgan expressly wished each of you to be present at the reading of his last will and testament, he said in a sonorous voice. I will not try your patience by reading out all the legal details of his will. Instead, Mr. Morgan wished me to, as he put it, cut to the chase. He cleared his throat. First, the late Mr. Morgan has appointed Daniel Morgan, his only child, as executor of his will. Daniel's duties will be to ensure that all taxes due are paid and that all outstanding debts and other obligations are discharged. Once these matters were properly addressed, he would see to the disposition of the estate in accordance with his father's terms and wishes. Daniel has agreed to fulfill these responsibilities and, I am informed, has already begun the process of settling debts, taxes, and other obligations. Susan cast a quick glance at Grant, giving him a brief smile of anticipation. That brings us to the question of the distribution of the estate, continued the lawyer. The first will concerns Mr. Morgan's house, in which he lived for the last 27 years of his life, and the lot on which it is situated. His will reads, I leave my house and lot to Paloma Contreras in gratitude for the long service she rendered me in time of sickness and need. I also leave any funds remaining in my checking account to help her pay her bills. What? exclaimed Susan in surprise. How can he give his house to that that maid? It should go to Daniel. Yes, you're right, Paloma replied, recovering from her surprise. It should go to Daniel, not me. She looked at Daniel for support, but he didn't return her gaze. Be that as it may, continued the lawyer. The late Mr. Morgan has made his wishes very clear. Now, if I may, I will proceed to the second will. When the group fell silent, the lawyer continued. The second bequest concerns the Andy Warhol painting hanging in my living room. I hereby leave Warhol to the Birchgrove Mansion and Museum to become part of its permanent collection. Oh my God, Nicholson gasped. No, it's all untrue, cried Susan. He can't do that. He had to leave Warhol to Daniel. I'm sorry, Mrs. Morgan, but Mr. Morgan bequeathed the Warhol painting to Birch Grove, the lawyer said. He wishes the painting to hang prominently in the museum. But that means Daniel gets nothing, shrieked Susan. His father cut him out of the will? How could he do that? It's not right. Ladies and gentlemen, the lawyer said loudly, please your attention. I have not finished reading the terms of the will. Please be aware that the second bequest Mr. Morgan made is conditional. The will goes on to say, my gift to Birchgrove is contingent upon the fulfillment of two requirements. 
First, Birch Grove must immediately and permanently sever all professional relationship with Mrs. Susan Morgan. Second, Mr. Grant Nicholson, the executive director of Birch Grove, must immediately and permanently terminate the relationship he had with Mrs. Susan Morgan. In the event that neither of these two requirements is fully complied with, ownership of the Warhols will pass to the Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh. He pointed to Grant Nicholson. In case you're wondering, sir, I sent notice of this conditional bequest to Pittsburgh just before this meeting. It is my understanding that the Warhol Museum will be monitoring your compliance in the most diligent manner possible. This is ridiculous, shrieked Susan. That noxious old man has no right to meddle in our private lives. She turned to Daniel. This is all your scheming, isn't it? You're trying to trick me out of what is legally mine. I would never do that, Susan. In fact, I have what is legally yours right here. With those words, he held out to her the envelope he had brought with him to the meeting. She tore it open and stared at the contents as if they were written in Greek. What is it? This is your legal notice that I have filed for divorce, he said. Then, pulling out his iPhone and taking a picture to document his actions, he said grimly, Susan Morgan, you have already received your notice. You bastard, you can't divorce me. I'm divorcing you, she shouted. Daniel only smiled. While she was screaming, Susan didn't notice that Grant had slipped quietly out of the room. When she finally realized he was gone, she hurried after him. Meanwhile, Paloma was trying to argue with Daniel. This is wrong, Daniel. Senor Morgan should have left his house to you, not me. You're his son. It's wrong that you have nothing. Now Daniel smiled. Paloma, it's okay. My father and I talked it over. He loved you and Marco and wanted to make sure you were taken care of when he was gone. He knew I understood and that I wanted that too. He took her by the shoulders and looked at her carefully. Don't you see? He was a grumpy, old-fashioned man who had a hard time expressing his feelings. He didn't know how to say how much he appreciated your care, your companionship, and the fact that you didn't charge him anything extra. It was his way of expressing his love. She wiped away fresh tears. Marco and I loved him too, Daniel. Susan literally ran down the Birch Grove hallway to Grant's office. Ignoring his secretary, she burst into her boss's office. Grant, Grant, she gasped. This is wonderful news. Once the Warhol collection is added to the collection, many new visitors will be drawn to the Birch Grove. You'll be the head of the most prestigious art museum in the county. Thank you, Susan, he replied cautiously. I think you're right. And when things settle down, she continued, our relationship will no longer have to be hidden, just like you wanted. His face narrowed. Didn't you hear what was added to the old man's estate in his will? He asked sharply. It can't be legally binding, she replied. It would be an occasion for gossip among the country club members, but it would quickly taper off. Except for the Warhol Museum, he objected. They'd love to add such an important exhibit to their collection, so they'll be watching us very closely. Fear was heard in her voice. But as I said, it can't be legal. No court would honor such a request. Now Grant was angry. Do you really expect Birchgrove to sue the Warhol Museum? Do you know what resources they have? They have Carnegie Foundation money behind them. If they sue, the legal fees could bankrupt us. He stood up and handed his former mistress a packet of papers. I'm sorry, Susan, but I've already spoken to Mr. Worthington about this. As of today, you are no longer an employee of Birch Grove. Grant, you can't do this, not after all we've meant to each other. Then her tone became harsher. Besides, you don't want me to tell your wife about us. I've already confessed to her, he said coldly to Susan. And as soon as I'm done here, I'm going home to continue the humiliation. I hope the prestige of being the wife of the executive director of Birchgrove will soften her resentment. Now it's time for you to leave the mansion. We'll arrange to have your severance pay mailed to you. She stood staring at him angrily, clenching her fists. Instinctively, he took a half step back, fearing she might attack him. Instead, she turned on her heel and strode away, heading down the hallway to her former office. She quickly grabbed a few personal items and walked out. As she passed the secretary's desk, Evita asked, Are you leaving, Mrs. Morgan? Yes, Susan replied without even looking at her. As her heels clacked on the marble, 
Evita called after her. Adios, puta! Then she hurried to Christina's desk to tell her what had just happened. Daniel was rummaging through the refrigerator for dinner when he heard the sound of keys in the front door. When he went out into the living room, he saw Susan enter with a sullen expression on her face. When she saw her soon-to-be ex-husband, the expression on her face became angry. This is all you're doing, isn't it? How long have you known about Grant and me? Long enough to blow up your little scheme, he replied. So you got Ezra to change his will, she said bitterly. He was going to leave everything to you, and you talked him into changing his will. Why did you do that? Because I wanted to be damn sure you'd never get your hands on it, no matter what happened. When I heard that you and your lawyer were thinking of declaring the Warhol common property, giving it to Birchgrove made sure that wouldn't happen. Besides, it gave me an opportunity to ruin your little affair with Grant. I figured his affection would fade quickly if I had to choose between you and Warhol. So you really hate me that much? He looked at her incredulously. After what you tried to do? You're damn right I did, he shouted. She stared at him, shocked that he was so angry. After a moment, he regained control of himself. I want to know one thing. Have you ever loved me? She sighed and sank into a chair. I think I realized that early on when we first got married. You were so dynamic, so full of potential. I thought you'd rise up the career ladder and take me with you. She shook her head, a bitter expression creasing her lips. Imagine my disappointment when I saw the path you chose. It wasn't long after that that I started looking for better opportunities. So money and prestige were always important to you. Love and a good life weren't enough. Very much like Norman Rockwell, she grinned. Don't you know, that's what losers choose when they don't have what it takes to win. Family, friends, community, is that your idea of loss? I need respect, the kind of respect that money and position give me. That's what's important, the rest is just decoration. He started to argue, but then decided against it. So what happens next? Her bravado evaporated. I'm leaving. Thanks to you, my reputation in this town has become trash. As soon as I've gathered what I need, I'll leave. And don't worry, if we divide the property equitably, I won't fight for a divorce. All I need is half of our savings and half of the proceeds from the house. I'm sorry, Susan, you're forgetting that we don't own this house. It belongs to the university. She gritted her teeth. You were always so smart. Why couldn't you have been more ambitious? Without waiting for an answer, she retired to her bedroom. A short time later, she emerged from there with a suitcase, a garment bag, and a makeup kit. I'm leaving, she told him. I'll have my lawyer contact yours and we'll get the divorce finalized as quickly as possible. She threw him an angry look. At least we agree on one thing. We both want to end this marriage. He looked at her curiously. So where are you going? As far away from here as possible, to where I can start over, hopefully with someone more aggressive. Daniel watched her walk away. Good riddance, he thought with satisfaction. This time, Susan proved to be true to her word, and their divorce went smoothly. Daniel hated having to pay alimony, but with his soon-to-be ex-wife now unemployed, he could hardly argue. It's a small price to pay to get rid of her, and an even smaller one considering what she tried to do to you, his lawyer advised him. Meanwhile, fulfilling his duties as executor of his father's estate kept Daniel busy. Every day seemed to bring a new requirement. Distributing copies of the death certificate, terminating his father's social security, notifying the IRS and filing the final 1040 return, sending court notices to creditors, and more. After class, Daniel regularly found himself at his father's house, going through things stashed away over the years, paying bills, and dealing with his father's financial affairs. To his horror, he discovered that his father paid for everything with paper checks. Until they were able to convert the bills to electronic payments, Daniel found that he had written more checks in a few weeks than he had in years. Although the job was time-consuming, it gave Daniel the opportunity to work in the company of Paloma and Marco. His home on campus seemed dark and gloomy, while his father's house was bright and lively. It wasn't uncommon for him to work into the evening and have dinner with the two of them. He felt guilty for imposing, but Paloma begged him to stay. Even when he was almost done settling his father's affairs, she begged him to keep having dinner with them. 
It's hard to cook for just the two of us, she argued, and he gladly gave in to her request. Belonging to a family, he felt, was good medicine, healing the grief of losing his father and the bitterness of a broken marriage. A few weeks later, Daniel got a call from his father's attorney. The probate court has signed the final accounting of your father's estate. You are now free to dispose of his estate as you see fit. Really? I thought probate usually takes a few months. The old man grinned. Normally you'd be right, but your father's will seems to have topped the list. Of course, that could have something to do with the fact that there are a lot of people on the Birch Grove Board of Directors. Seems like they can't wait to get their hands on their new prize. In any case, you can move forward now. An hour after speaking with his attorney, Daniel received a call from Grant Nicholson, inquiring when Birch Grove would be able to take possession of the Warhol painting. As I think you know, the museum and I have fully honored the terms of your father's will. And now that it has gone through probate, we look forward to proceeding with its transfer. Although the legal hurdles were over, a new complication arose. The museum curator insisted that her people pack and transport the silkscreen to Berezovaya Grove themselves. But the transfer had to be coordinated with the security company, which had to carefully disable all security devices and systems. Safely dismantling and decommissioning the various systems was a challenge. It took the two teams almost a full day to accomplish the transfer. Waiting for the progress reports in his office, Nicholson felt like a child on Christmas Eve. By tomorrow morning, the most valuable piece of art ever owned by the Birch Grove would be in their possession. In honor of the occasion, the museum was going to have a private showing for the board of directors and special guests the following evening. The awkwardness of his affair with Susan remained in the rearview mirror, and the future of the museum and its executive director loomed ahead. After arranging with a security company to guard his father's house for the duration of the Warhol transfer, Daniel took Paloma and Marco on a day trip to the Pocono Mountains. The three of them hiked a scenic trail, had lunch at the Flagstaff Lodge Hotel, and took a ride on the Lehigh Gorge Scenic Railway. By the time they got home, everyone except the guard from the security company had left. The living room had been cleaned and the furniture put back in its place. However, Marilyn Monroe's smiling face from the poster was gone, and all three of them sensed its absence. Trying to break the somber mood, Daniel decided to rack his brain. It's too late to make dinner. How about we order pizza? The offer was gladly accepted, and soon the three of them were eating several large pizzas. By the time they were done, the combination of the heavy meal and the day's chores had exhausted them all. Marco was already asleep, and Daniel carried him to bed. As he headed for the front door, Paloma stopped him. Please, Daniel, stay here tonight. With all the security systems gone, I'll feel safer. You can sleep in your father's room. He tried to object, but she insisted, and after a long day, he didn't feel like arguing. So when Paloma went to her room to sleep, she hadn't moved since Senor Morgan's death, Daniel stripped down to a t-shirt and boxer shorts and got into his father's bed. The memories and the unfamiliarity of the bed kept him awake at first. But he must have been more comfortable than he thought, for he quickly fell into sleep. After a while, however, he was awakened by a sound in the hallway. When he sat up in bed, wondering if he had imagined it, the sound was repeated. Suddenly, he saw Paloma's shadowy figure open the door, tiptoe to his bed, and slip under the covers. He started to speak, but she covered his mouth. Please, Daniel, it's been so long for me, and I've been so alone. And they had sex. The next night, the Birch Grove was celebrating Warhol's installation. Grant Nicholson arrived early, leaving his wife to come separately. So you could make a grand entrance, he told her. As he was going through the list of documents needed for the party, there was a knock on his office door. When he looked up, he saw the concerned face of the museum curator. What's the matter? He asked impatiently. Sir, there's something wrong with Warhol, the woman said worriedly. What? It's not damaged, is it? No, sir, it's nothing like that. It just doesn't look quite right. It doesn't look good? What are you talking about? It's just that some of the colors don't look the way they should. It's an artist's tryout, Nicholson exploded. It doesn't have to look perfect. The curator wrinkled her nose but stood by her opinion. And Warhol's signature, sir, it's not faded like it should be. I mean, he signed it in the 60s. The ink should have faded. Is that what's bothering you? How do you know what ink Warhol used? 
Go back and make sure everything is ready. The guests will be here any minute. The little woman didn't budge. But that's not the problem, sir. The problem is that he's the wrong size. What? Yes, sir. Warhol's Marilyn Monroe is 36 inches by 36 inches. I checked to make sure. The proof should be the same size. But this print is only 35 inches square. Worthington's mouth dropped open. So what exactly are you trying to say? The curator looked like she was about to cry. Sir, this engraving is a fake, a forgery. There's no way it's authentic. Oh my God! exclaimed the museum director, leaning back in his chair and trying to realize the full horror of her revelation. Are you sure? he asked in desperation. Yes, sir. I'm very sorry. He stared silently into the distance, stunned by what was happening. Sir, sir, the curate interrupted concernedly. What do you want us to do? Shall we hang her after all? Are you crazy? exclaimed Nicholson, making the woman wince. If people find out we knowingly hung a fake piece of art, it will mean the end of Birch Grove. He shuddered, then pointed at the curator. Take the work down and hide it. Tell your people to turn off the lights and put up the event canceled sign. When the woman hesitated, Nicholson shouted, Do it! Do it now before it's too late! The curate swept away and Nicholson stood still, contemplating the misfortune that had befallen him. A thought occurred to him, and he rushed to his secretary's desk. Call the guard at the main entrance and tell him to chain the main gate. Quick, quick! She paused. What should I tell him to tell his guests? Just say the event has been canceled due to extraordinary circumstances. Nothing more. Now hurry up! And no more phone calls, understand? The frightened girl nodded, but no sooner had she picked up the phone than the ringing sounded. Sir, she said, it's the curator again. Would you like to speak to her? What does she want now? He asked rhetorically as the secretary sat waiting nervously. All right, I'll admit her to my office. And you ring the gate on the other line and make sure no one else enters, he ordered. Back at his desk, Nicholson picked up the phone and the handler began to mumble something. It's the caterer, sir. He wants to know what to do with the food you ordered. Tell him to take it back, Nicholson exploded. We certainly don't need it. I've already tried that, sir, but he says he can't. It's all spread out on the tables already. He says it's forbidden to take it back now. Damn it, then tell him to take her to the homeless shelter. Champagne and caviar, sir? Just do it, he snarled and slammed the phone down. Sitting down in his chair, Nicholson rested his head on his hands, trying to think of a way out of the disaster. This can't be happening, he repeated. Would you mind telling me what in heaven's name is going on? Came a familiar voice. I had to walk all the way from the main gate to get up here. The exhausted director looked into the flaming face of the chairman of the board of directors. Adrenaline pulsed through Grant's system as he desperately tried to think of a way to calm the angry man. Actually, Mr. Worthington, we managed to avoid disaster. When we discovered the problems with the Warhol, I knew you wouldn't want the festivities to continue. What do you mean Warhol trouble? demanded the executive, leaning threateningly toward Nicholson. Sir, it looks like the print is a fake, a forgery, sir. A forgery, shouted Worthington. How the hell could you accept a forgery? You're supposed to be art experts. Did it not occur to you to examine it before turning on the PR machine and bragging to the world about your coup? I know how it looks, sir, but there was the matter of the will and then we had to work with a security company to get it here. Sir, you should have seen the kind of security this old man had. Enough, thundered Worthington. As it stands, Birchgrove will be the laughing stock of the art world for years to come. And I think I speak for the board of directors when I say that you are the ones responsible for this failure. Consider yourself fired as of tonight. As soon as you can get through this horrible traffic jam you've created there, you must leave this premises and never come back. Before Nicholson could object, Van Worthington turned and strode away, without even a glance at the cowardly girl behind the desk. Oh my God, I'm broke, the former executive director moaned. When word gets out about this, no museum in the country will hire me. As he sat wallowing in self-pity, his secretary suddenly appeared. 
Sir, you're being summoned, she said excitedly. I told you, Nicholson growled. No more phone calls? I'm sorry, Mr. Nicholson, but this is your wife. And she asked me to tell you that if you don't talk to her, you shouldn't come home tonight. Nicholson was beaten. All right, let her through, he agreed. When the connection was made, he was left in no doubt about how angry Greta was. You better have a damn good explanation for this, Grant. I've been stuck here in traffic for God knows how long. People walk up and down the row of cars, and when they see me, they want to know what's going on. And I, the CEO's wife, am as clueless as they are. If you wanted to humiliate me, you couldn't have found a better way to do it. She paused to catch her breath. So what do you have to say for yourself? It's very simple, dear, Nicholson said calmly. When we hung Warhol in the showroom, we discovered it was a fake. Fake? She exclaimed. Of course, we couldn't exhibit the fake, so we had no choice but to cancel the show. It's too bad we didn't discover the problem until the last minute. He paused, swallowed, and then decided to accept his fate. Unfortunately, in situations like this, someone has to be the scapegoat, whether it's their fault or not. Despite all I've done for Birchgrove, Van Worthington just relieved me of my duties, and immediately. She sighed. Worthington fired your ass? Oh my God, that really can't hurt. She took a deep breath. Look, Grant, I've put up with a lot from you over the years, not the least of which was your sordid affair with that little slut you hired as director of development. I've looked the other way too many times, but this is too far gone. Don't come home tonight or ever, except to get your personal belongings. My lawyer will file for divorce first thing in the morning. Do you understand? He sighed the way an exhausted man sighs. Do you understand? She repeated. Yes, dear. When he heard the call cut off, he dropped his head to the table, completely defeated. Paloma learned of the disastrous discovery at Birch Grove and Grant Nicholson's dismissal from Christina. When she rushed to tell Daniel about it, he greeted the news with satisfaction but not surprise. I told you I was going to get back at him for what he did to my marriage, he said. She looked at him perplexed. But how could you have known this would happen? I didn't do it. Well, not really. But I set it up so he'll probably get himself all over it. He grinned. I couldn't have known he'd do it so publicly and humiliatingly, but I was sure of the outcome regardless. And after what he and Susan tried to do, I think he got what he deserved. Paloma was now looking at him intently. So what exactly did you do, Senor Daniel? I still don't understand. He smiled. Come with me to my office at the university. I can show you around there. When they were in his cluttered office, he motioned her to a chair and then sat down himself. Let's talk about Susan first, he said. As you know, her plan was to keep her affair with Nicholson a secret until Parkinson's disease killed my father. My father's condition was deteriorating rapidly, so she was sure she wouldn't have to wait too long. She couldn't file before my father died because she needed me to inherit his estate. That way, she would have gotten half of everything. His house was valuable, but the real prize, of course, was his war hall. I don't know what legal maneuver she planned to pull, but her lawyer was confident she could get war hall deeded as community property. After the settlement, she would walk away with half the auction value, big money. But you and your cousin found out about her affair, and when I found out what she and Grant were up to, I went to talk to my father. I knew he wanted to leave war hall to me. But after I learned of Susan's plans, I urged him to keep his job at Birch Grove. Not only would it be out of her reach, but we could use the bequest as leverage against her. He smiled. And it worked. When Grant found out that the only way to get Warhol for Birch Grove would be to sever all ties with my wife, he dropped Susan like a hot potato. Daniel became thoughtful. I don't know if Grant was truly in love with Susan, but I'm sure she was just using him as another rung on the social ladder. Anyway, she quickly realized how deep his affection for her ran. When my father's will was announced, she lost her job, her lover, and of course her marriage to me. Everything worked out just as I had hoped. By the way, a friend told me the other day that Susan moved to Allentown. He heard that the only job she could find was working at a telemarketing center selling insurance. Instead of moving up in her career, my ex-wife has moved down significantly. This is perhaps the most agonizing punishment I could wish for her. I understand your revenge on Susan, 
Paloma nodded. And in my opinion, she got what she deserved. Cheating on your husband is bad enough, but conspiring to prey on you and your father is awful, she said, using the Spanish pronunciation. But what about Nicholson? What did you do to him? He grinned. You know about what happened in Birchgrove last night, don't you? Well, some of it. Mostly, I was just shocked to find out that your father's work wasn't real. Sadness appeared in her eyes. In a way, I'm glad Senor Morgan didn't have to hear that cruel news. Daniel looked at her appraisingly. It says a lot that your first reaction is to think of my father. He rose from his seat. But you shouldn't be too sad about him. Reaching for the filing cabinet, he pulled out the Marilyn Monroe study guide he'd used in his introductory course and placed it on the desk. She looked at him uncertainly. A great writer once said that the best way to keep something safe is to hide it in plain sight. Let me show you something. He turned the print over so she could see the backside covered in brown paper. Carefully peeling off the paper, he found the inscription. To Ezra Morgan for all his hard work. Andy Warhol. Is that a real seal? sighed Paloma. But it's the one you use in your classes. You told me about it, and it's just lying here in your office. Daniel smiled and nodded. But when did you have time to change the painting? The other print was hanging in your father's living room long before Marco and I moved in. If anything, it was long before you knew about Susan's plans. And with all the security that Senor Morgan had, how could you have switched him? Daniel grinned. At first, Dad didn't think his print was worth that much. After all, Warhol originally sold his stencils for only a few hundred dollars a piece. But as the popularity of his work grew, Dad became concerned about having an authentic print of the artist's work in his home. He and I discussed the matter, and I offered to trade the real thing for a cheap print. I would keep the real Warhol here and use it in my lectures so no one would suspect it had any value. And the reproduction would hang on his living room wall. Later, as the value of Warhol's work continued to rise, my father came up with the idea of putting guards to protect it. He figured that no one would question the authenticity of a work protected by all these security measures. It became a game for him, constantly looking for new high-tech gadgets for protection. Daniel smiled at Paloma. Thankfully, there was no attempted break-in, but I'm sure all that security helped convince Nicholson that he was getting the real thing. So you exchanged fingerprints before I went to work for your father? That's right. I had intended to switch them when my father eventually passed away. But after I found out about Grant and Susan, I had a way to get back at them both. After I talked to my father that night, he had his attorney rewrite his will so that Nicholson would be sure to leave Susan. Then I let Grant take the fake Warhol, figuring he'd want to show off his prize as quickly and as publicly as possible. Sure enough, he took the bait. And like Susan, he lost his job, his marriage, and his reputation. So what happens now? My plan is to let all this turmoil in Birchgrove subside. Once that happens, I will quietly inform the council that I found the real Warhol in a storage container I didn't know about. When they've had a chance to verify its authenticity, I'll ask them to put a plaque on it that will remind them of my father's connection to Warhol. Aren't you sorry you didn't take Warhol for yourself? After all, she was very valuable. He smiled at her. To be honest, I don't feel guilty at all. I never wanted the responsibility of owning an important work of art. And as for money, it was Susan who craved wealth and status, not me. After seeing what that lust did to her, I'm just as happy to have it out of my hands. Then his smile grew even wider. Besides, I hope that all of this will help me in accomplishing a more important goal. She looked at him uncertainly. What's the purpose of this? Becoming part of a new family. What did you just say? What's the new family? Daniel walked around the table and took her hands in his. The new family is you, Marco, and me. When the graduate student who had come to see Professor Morgan saw the couple in each other's arms, she smiled and tiptoed away. Once far down the hallway, she called out to a fellow student. Remember we were so worried about Professor Morgan when he lost his father and wife? I think our favorite professor is going to be fine. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.